bringing attention to the destruction of the three World Trade Center towers in New York City on September 11, 2001, and a whole lot more. This is 9-11 Free Fall. Hi, everyone. This is Andy Steele. I'm back again for another show, and I'm glad to be back. I'll be joined today by Les Jameson, a great activist from New York who's been pounding the pavement and fighting for this cause for quite a long time. He was at the Rethink 9-11 rally that I presented to you in last week's show, so we'll talk some about that and about some of the things he's been involved with over the years. And of course, uh, we'll get his take on the movement and the situation we now find ourselves in as a country having to live with an enormous lie for the past 12 years. All right, because the Twin Towers and Building 7 were brought down in a controlled demolition. And this is not a theory or an opinion, folks. It is what happened. And the truth has been exposed, but the establishment is counting on you out there to keep your head in the sand and keep your mouths shut. Well, I have faith in you people. I have faith in all of you out there. And I know that more and more of you are acknowledging this reality and speaking out about it. And I'm here to help you along, to give you that cheering section that I think all people need when they're tackling difficult tasks like this one. And I'm here to let you know that you are not alone out there, that future generations will know about the real nature of the crime that was committed on 9-11. So all of your work is not in vain. We are winning. So there's been a lot happening in the news with regard to the Rethink 9-11 campaign and and sort of taking a week off. Um, by by dedicating the whole show to just playing the speeches in Times Square uh, that were given on the anniversary. I feel like i got some catching up to do with you here on this show. Anyone who wants to listen, of course, to those speeches can listen to last week's show. Uh, we had some of them, and uh, there's a more complete uh, archive of them out there on YouTube. You can just look it up. Um, great, great time had there, great uh, speakers, um, definitely worth your while, definitely worth the time that was taken to be put into that campaign. I want to congratulate all the people who were involved. It was very successful. And I guess I haven't given my impressions of it yet. I'll do it really quickly here. Um, and we're going to be going over it somewhat with less, so I'm not going to jump too far ahead here. But you know, seeing that billboard in Times Square for the first time, and I happened to be with Richard Gage the first time that he put his eyes on it too. It is actually bigger in person than it seems in the picture. Believe it or not, usually it's the opposite. I know. But no, in this case, at least in my perceptions, it was bigger in person than it was in the pictures. I'm very happy with that, and I'm very proud, like I said, of everybody that is involved. It's very hard to put something like this together when you're running against so many walls, but they were able to do it. So good job. Um, I'm going to start off now our news segment with this article from CBS's Philadelphia affiliate, it's written by Paul Kurt, and it was published on 9-11 of this year, and it's titled, Group of Engineers Believe Controlled Detonations uh, Took Down World Trade Center. And what's great about this article is that it is both accurate and it's neutral about the topic. Go figure. And it's about architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. It, it covers them accurately, too. Um, the author interviewed Tony Zimbodi, the, the mechanical engineer who I've had on this show, you may remember. And it doesn't get into saying AE blames any party for the attacks, just that they know the buildings were brought down in a controlled demolition. In fact, the article says... The group doesn't speculate as to who may have planted the charges, but it's launching a new campaign today to spur a new investigation. And this article also acknowledges in the first paragraph that this is a growing movement and doesn't try to marginalize it. So, folks, this is a good article. Good job, Paul Kurt, wherever you are. Um, next, we got this one from Time Magazine, uh, titled uh, "September 9/11" or "September Excuse me, September 11 Truthers Mark Anniversary." And actually, despite the slightly patronizing title with the single quote marks around the word "truthers," this is a pretty fair article too, in my opinion. It talks about the campaign about AE 9/11 Truth and acknowledges that more people question 9/11 than at first than at first they thought, or rather, what at first they chose to acknowledge. So you can check that out, too, by the way, by going to Rethink911.org, uh, along with all the other articles I'm bringing up today. They have them listed there for, for you to, to look at. Um, and moving on, we, we have 
these articles that are about Canada and the Canadian press's attempt to attack the ads. Uh, first, we have this snotty tone piece from Katie Dobbs at the Toronto Star, titled "Truth or Billboard in Yang Duda Square Ask Questions About September 11th." Now, I'm not going to read it out loud here. We don't have time, but the article attempts to marginalize the campaign. It appeals to the perceived authority of NIST and tries to do it in such a way as, so as to make it seem like the matter is settled already. And, of course, folks who listen to this show, who follow the movement, who go to AE911 Truth on a regular basis to their webpage know that it's not. Um, the article makes a point, too, of, of asserting that Building 7 wasn't hit by a missile, which, of course, nobody that I know, and I know a lot of people in this movement, I've never, ever heard anybody say Building 7 was hit by a missile. I don't know anybody that believes that. All right? So this is just an attempt by the author of the article to insert nonsense into it, and, you know, a nonsense idea and associate it with the over 2,000 building experts who know that pre-planted explosives brought Building 7 down. All right, sloppy journalism, just done on purpose to divert people from the facts. Not a good plan, Katie. <laughs> As we've learned here in the States, all that still has not made the facts go away, and more and more people are questioning. Um, then we have a number of articles about Rethink 9-11 subway ads in Ottawa, including this one from Sub Sun News, in which the mayor of Ottawa, his name is Jim Watson, uh, begrudgingly admits Canadians have the right to free speech and that the ads uh, fit within the city's advertising policy, while he, at the same time he makes sure he gets on record that he thinks that the ads are disrespectful, quote-unquote. Um, the Rethink 9-11 campaign responded to him, of course, with a statement on their site saying this. I'm going to read it. The Rethink 9-11 coalition includes 9-11 victims' family members who want nothing more than an accurate and unbiased accounting of the deaths of their loved ones. Uh, to these surviving family members, seeking the truth is the most profound way to honor their loved ones. Your words ignore their search for truth and cause more pain. And it also says, if free speech does not protect the right to make factually uncontroversial statements in public, what does it protect? Any effort to remove the Rethink 911 ads or curtail free speech on the uh, OC Transpo would likely be ruled unconstitutional in a court of law. And I don't know a lot about Canadian law, folks. But I can tell you that it's not disrespectful, and I shouldn't even have to state that. Anybody who does say that is really – they're the ones who have lost their marbles. Okay, It's not disrespectful to ask questions about a murder investigation. All right, If, you, if, you, if, a, if a child dies in a uh, mysterious fashion, I mean what, one thing that investigators look at is the parents. Is that disrespectful? All right, but these are common sense things. And I know that we've lost touch with a lot of our common sense here in the world – but we're, we're slowly regaining it. People are shaking the, the, their heads and rubbing the fuzziness from their eyes and beginning to realize that, uh, that you know, physics is not a conspiracy theory. Um, so that is some of the coverage from the Parrot Media about the Rethink 9-11 campaign. Um, and I want to move on now and play for you this excellent clip from Abby Martin at RT talking about the American media and its attacks on people who question the official story of 9-11. Um, this clip is around two and a half minutes long, and I'm not sure the day it aired. It obviously recent, but it was put up on YouTube on her show's account on September 11th of this year. So I'm going to play that for you right now. As we reflect upon the tragic events of September 11th, there are undoubtedly many who are still seeking answers. Throughout the last 12 years, we've seen nothing but corruption and deceit echoed throughout the political and media establishment, all to perpetuate endless war and the erosion of our rights. This government can no longer be trusted at its word about pretty much anything. Instead, we need to seek out the truth for ourselves. Unfortunately, the act of questioning anything about this event now runs you the risk of being dismissed as a conspiracy theorist or a lunatic by the corporate media. That the government would deliberately kill 3,000 people to accuse the president of this because of this, he's protecting oil interests. Governor, uh, uh, that's a terrible accusation to make. I cannot say that any member of the Bush administration knew it was going to happen or wanted it to happen. It's a ridiculous thing to say. Every time Rosie O'Donnell says something about 9-11 conspiracies or the fillings in your teeth being like a mind-numbing uh, government plot against you, I mean, it's it's gone too far at this point. It, 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 it really hasn't. 
Apparently it's a disgrace to want more than a stack of paperwork and a congressional seal to find out how much the government knew and what it chose to do or not do on that terrible day. And perhaps the most fascinating of terms that have become a pejorative for the establishment is truther. When did seeking the truth become a bad thing? And how the pursuit of any kind of facts become so objectionable? Look, this dismissal is deliberate. It's also severely dumbing down the dialogue we should be having. And in fact, it's an endangerment to investigative journalism. For crying out loud, to question official narratives is the role of journalists, historians, and documentarians. Otherwise, we'd just be getting our news verbatim from government press releases. And most journalists who do question further get praise for their determination and courage to not accept an answer at face value. But for some reason, 9-11 is put into a different category altogether. If someone wants to dig deeper and not accept the government's analysis at face value, they're considered almost un-American. I guess it makes people too comfortable, too uncomfortable to believe that the same criminal cabal that oversaw a torture program murdered a million Iraqis and started a war based on known falsehoods might just might have the lack of empathy to allow such a tragedy to occur to advance its geopolitical goals. So if a truther is simply a person that cares about evidence and facts, no matter how ugly or uncomfortable they may be, then maybe that's a label we should all embrace. Okay, so there you go. Great commentary from a great pundit and journalist, Abby Martin, and it, and it really hits the nail on the head. All right, And all I'm going to add to it is... How upside down does it show our world is where the media uses the word truth in a slur against people? All right, that fact alone should frighten all of you. And I feel like we're in some kind of really badly written comic book, you know, some kind of dystopian story where the government and media are so over the top phony and so over the top corrupt, you can't even believe it. You can't even believe that they would put that some writer would write that. All right, it just doesn't seem realistic. Well, believe it, folks. All right, because it's all true. But it doesn't have to be true anymore. And we are continuing to gain ground, so don't be disheartened. Don't lose focus. Just keep pushing the machine. Keep pushing back. The monster will fall back into the ocean. I promise you. The people that make up the media machine are not invincible. All right, not by any stretch of the imagination. And they're showing it now more than ever. Now, before we get to our guests, we're going to take our weekly 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all of the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. So we'll do that starting right now. Okay, and that is 10 seconds. Now, our guest today, like I said, is Les Jameson. Les is a resident of Brooklyn, and he studied the alternative research into 9-11 since uh, November of 2001. He was a main organizer for the three-year-long film series at St. Mark's Church on Sundays in New York's East Village and a leading organizer for the NYC 9-11 ballot initiative. He's also been central in planning several large 9-11 symposiums around the country and anniversary events in New York City, including the Rethink 9-11 rally in Times Square under uh, the, the campaign's billboard that we were talking about earlier. Les, welcome to 9-11 Free Fall. Thank you very much, Andy. Glad to be here. Now, I'm always asked this of my guests uh, the first time they're on, and I particularly want to know this with you since you started looking into the real story behind 9-11 as, as early as two months after the attacks happened. What caused you to wake up and start speaking out about it? Well, the day of 9-11, I uh, had a few, um, you know, instinctual feelings that just kind of triggered me uh, into thinking that it, it, something's not right here. And then um, well, those specific, uh, specifically were uh, the fact that U.S. intelligence, which is the most uh, highly developed, sophisticated in the world, you know, and it, had to know something was up. That that was one of my feelings. The other one was, um, as I was watching TV, the TV before the collapse of the towers, because uh, it within minutes, um, all the news, the local news channels turned to footage uh, pointing there to what was going on. And uh, as I was watching, I was thinking to myself, you know, good thing that those towers could never fall, and then they did. So then two months later, um, 
we have a Pacific station here, WBAI, and there was a program there by uh, uh, a gentleman named Ralph Schoenman, who is a decades-long veteran uh, social movement uh, expert. He's, I call him a, a walking encyclopedia, and he had already had it figured out, and uh, that that triggered my uh, research right from there. Uh, then Mike Rupert was circulating an, an email in January of 01, I believe, of 02, I'm sorry, uh, about the CIA. Uh, also, just the incredible anom anomaly uh, that it's impossible that they could not know what was going on because of the, again, highly sophisticated uh, signals intelligence that uh, this, this uh, country has, this surveillance state has, even then. So that's what started for me. Then, um, gosh, uh, I kept at it. I, you know, not too long after, I was doing some research, and I came up with a document on the web called um, How to Start a War. And it talked about all the U.S. wars starting from the Mexican-American War in uh, 1849 right up through to the Gulf Wars and uh, the history of, of all those incidents that triggered those wars. And uh, it was amazing in that every one of our wars uh, had uh, aspects that were uh, manipulation and uh, orchestration from the highest levels. Uh, the Spanish-American War, World War One, Two, Vietnam, of course, and uh, invasion of Panama, and so forth, and of course Gulf War One and Two, and uh, so that really helped me uh, in terms of the uh, understanding the historical context, and uh, that's so important for people to uh, help wrap their heads around this in in incredible attack that. Uh, all evidence appears well uh, that the the official story is so implausible it, it doesn't even begin uh, to be logical. So uh, that you know can be shattering for people, but when once they start to understand the uh, uh, historical context and understand that you know when the uh, the Cold War ended. There was supposed to be a, a peace dividend, and right away we're off launching uh, into these um, um, cultural wars against Islam and so forth, and then we have a brand new enemy there, and uh, it's just part of the uh, the geopolitical design here, where the U.S. Had, the population has got to be kept in a position where they're in a state of fear, anxiety. Um, always uh, on guard in thinking that they're being attacked and then in a, a position where they're going to want revenge and condone what ex exactly has been happening for the last, uh, you know, geez, actually since Gulf War One, and then uh, absolutely since 9-11 where we launched into uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, and um and Libya, and then now just about launching into Syria. So um, that's kind of how I got started, Andy. And um, uh, 2004, uh, in December of 2004, I saw a, a photo somewhere on the Internet, I can't remember where, of some guys going down to ground zero with a big banner saying the Bush regime engineered 9-11. And uh, I went down there the very next Saturday. It was our early January. And uh, I just went every Saturday since for uh, the next four years. And, you know, that's when a lot of activity happened here in New York in the, in the movement. Right. And, I, I, you know, I'm listening to you talk right now, and I almost want to pen a piece, a satirical piece called Death Wish Nation. And what I'm referencing is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those old movies, Death Wish, but they always start off with the main character having some horrible tragedy befall one of his loved ones that he needs to go out and avenge. And this is how these wars are, are always sold to us, it seems like, is that we've got to have some kind of event where we have, uh, like you said, you know, people have to be uh, seeking revenge. For it, and it's almost like a story is presented to us. Um, so, no, I, I agree with you completely. Now, I want to know for you, and, and what do you consider to be the biggest smoking gun evidence for you personally? Well, I would have to say, I mean, there's so many. Um, I, I've 
really made a, an effort to uh, uh, take a real comprehensive view. And you, you know why? Because Andy, it's I found it interesting, and uh, you probably know, you know, that uh, I've been in a position to try and engage so many people, thousands of people here, to uh, you know get them to open their minds and do the research. And it really varies uh, for people, so that's why I myself got into so many different areas <clears throat> areas of research but the biggest smoking gun um you know the the obvious one of course is building 7 uh and that collapse and, and the fact that it has been withheld from public view for all these years you know i they played it once that night i remember seeing it on tv and that then that was it, it was, you, you know it was not shown on tv while tower 1 and 2 and the the planes uh, striking those buildings were played thousands of times, you know. So, um, what else besides that obvious one? You know what I find strange is the fact that within one hour, they had Bin Laden's uh, face all over TV. <laughs> within an hour of the attacks, they get bought there. It was solved, and then within 24 hours, they had these 19, uh, you know, Arab hijackers, alleged hijackers, all over TV. You know, something that's impossible. I find that just, you know, impossible, illogical, and uh, beyond implausible. Um, the destruction of the steel, you know, at Ground Zero, the, where it was shipped overseas and melted down. Uh, that that was a major smoking gun. And, of course, the the uh, fact that it, the government, Bush, the Bush administration withheld from uh, conducting an investigation for 14 months and only then gave in or caved in to uh, the 9-11 families, uh, specifically the, the four Jersey girls. That, that's unheard of. That's just um, beyond comprehension that that would have occurred. It's amazing because you hear – and it's in the movie that people should watch out there is Press for Truth if you want to hear about this uh, this part of it. We usually just focus on the science, but this is all something that people should be seeing. And I love how the, how Bush comes out afterwards, after finally agreeing to testify with Dick Cheney in the room with him, comes out and speaks to the press. And he's and he almost sounds – he's saying, I, I'm glad I did it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it. Like he's talking about cleaning out some spare room that he's been meaning to get to for a few years. You know, I'm glad I finally got to it. I mean, the biggest mass murder happened in my first year of my presidency. I'm finally glad that I got to talk to a uh, commission and get some things off my chest. I mean, it's just so stupid. And then, of course, the, pre the, the reporter asked him, you know, why did you insist on on meeting with the uh, the vice president and not by yourselves? And, and it was a very elusive answer. He just kind of reiterates because it's a good chance to talk to the commission. And, and people can see it for themselves. And, and, and tell me what you think of his answer right in. Um, but I, I just think that's absolutely amazing that they didn't even want an investigation into this. It took rabble-rousing just to make one happen. And you know you you attended the commission hearings, right? I and I hear it brought up by politicians all the time is the 9/11 commission. It's the definitive word on what happened on 9/11. Right. You know this is so they can defer their own judgment and responsibility on investigating it. So I want you to give us first of all you know talk about getting into the commission hearings, how you did that, and give us your own historical narrative on what you witnessed there. Sure. Well, you know the second. No, I'm sorry. It was the the third and fourth. Uh, hearings that I went to. In the, the third was here in New York City at the New School down on 13th Street. And uh, so we were there uh, actually on the street outside, and there was a media circus there. The whole block was nothing but media with, um, with monitors of what was going on inside. And I, I, I elected to stay right there and watched everything that was going on in the street, because I uh, could also see what was going on inside. And also, we were passing out uh, brochures that we had made that looked like an official, um, official document to give people as they were going in. And uh, there we were standing in line with all these like um, security types and legislators and family members going in. We were passing them these um, little like color printed brochures 
about the, uh, the you know the hard questions uh, that we already had at that point, and uh, so that's that was interesting, and of course that that was the one where uh, the families absolutely erupted because of um, the the nine eleven commission's deference to Mayor Rudy Giuliani. They they were like just giving him such softball questions, and the, the families were outraged. They they knew they they were. Um, it was very clear to them what was going on here was just a, a, a charade, you know, a pretend investigation. Uh, Ellen Mariani was there, by the way, and I remember speaking to her as she came out, and they were just, just disgusted. Then the fourth one was in Washington, D.C. That was focused on the um, air defense situation and NOR, NORAD. And you know what, Andy? It was amazing. It was uh, a day and a half hearing, as I remember. Um, no more than that, and they uh, questioned some uh, uh, FAA officials. Also, um, uh, gosh, the head of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Myers, uh, he came in for about 15 minutes, then then split. <laughs> and um, Eberhard, General Eberhard, was there, and he took some questions, as I remember. And um, it was just amazing how little actually could get covered. Instead, uh, instead of a day and a half hearing, that needed to be at least a week and a half to get to the detail of the um, absence of the air defense that morning. Uh, and you know, just that, that you know, you ask uh, about smoking guns. That is a gigantic smoking gun that uh, the fighter jets that are, by protocol are supposed to be in the air to divert any planes that are off course within 10 minutes. You know, um, usually that's the case by 12, 15 minutes tops. They're in the air, and uh, two of them, uh, either side of the errant plane, and then they... Uh, they es escorted back to the to landing, so of course that did not happen. Even with these uh, unbelievable anomalies that were going on with those four jets, you know, with the transponders being shut off, which is um, against protocol, and then of course uh, military radar spotting them going way off course, you know, doing U turns in the sky, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, it was very clear that that was nothing but cover up there uh, at that hearing, and uh, you know, same thing when I attended the NIST hearings. Um, very clear, and that what they, uh, what the government is able to do is put on these very official-looking uh, events that you know, the engineers in gray suits, and of course the commissioners there in the table, everything looking very serious and official and uh, heavy-handed and, of course, security in the room. And, um, and it's, it's just amazing how uh, this deception is so well orchestrated and um, put on as a show. And unfortunately, the media, you know, just gave it all a big pass, you know. So what... Uh, you know, we have to do as individuals is do our own research. David Ray Griffin wrote a book and a paper. Uh, there's a 12-page paper. Anybody can look up online. It's called The 541-Page Lie by David Ray Griffin. And he lists about 112 different lies, errors, and omissions of the 9-11 the Commission report. Because he, he read it through, you know, word by word and just uh, analyzed it under a, a magnifying glass. Then he went and uh, he wrote an entire book on the topic, on the 9-11 Commission. Uh, so that, that is so important because um, here we are uh, in looking at 9-11 and, and dealing with trying to expose the truth, uh, expose the lies, and the fact that a cover-up existed, a cover-up occurred is a, is a crime of national importance. It's a crime that is um, 
on the level of uh, the highest of felonies, I guess. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, you know, cover up is is a, is a very serious crime, and that's what occurred. Uh, also, there was a book by Philip Sheenon, S H E N O N, a New York Times reporter, about the uh, the 911 commission. He went into detail into some of the personalities and uh, uh, Zelikov, Philip Zelikov, and uh, and Art Farmer and, and many others involved there, and of course uh, Kane and Hamilton, and uh, that was fascinating. So this is a whole uh, big area that I, I think is very important. And uh, you mentioned, by the way, uh, Press for Truth. There was a sequel that was even better, I think, called uh, In Their Own Words, and it's the um, the footage that didn't make it into Press for Truth. Well, I'll have to check that out. I'm not familiar with that, but from what the, from what I gathered and from people who were talking about it, people like Bob McElvain from the footage, is that uh, you know it just seems like it's a bunch of people in high positions. In my opinion, a lot of people shouldn't be there uh, just for sheer incompetence, but people in high positions basically congratulating each other and and looking out for each other's backs. And I see this, you know, like with C-SPAN, their, their idea of investigative journalism is to turn to, let's say, somebody who's in the FBI and say, do you think that the government was involved with 9-11? I mean, just take a que- first of all, take a question completely out of context. If that's just asking about explosives in Building 7, change it around to the guy uh, to blaming the government for 9-11, and then say, do you think the government was responsible for it? And then the person answers, no. If it was, I'd know about it. And then that's that's their investigative reporting. It's like a big joke. If it wasn't so serious, it would be funny, but it's not. And it's scary to know just how alone the people are uh, in in protecting themselves and their own interests. I've made the joke you know, to people that uh, that I know before that, you know, someone in a uniform, could, it's going to get to the point in this country that somebody in a uniform could drag me out in the street and shoot me in the head, and uh, people will just stand there and nervously smile as it happens. I, I don't think that we're that far off. I'm just saying that we have become so apathetic, so so powerless feeling in the face of this big monster that we live under, um, this big inept monster, mm. you know, because most of these people you talk to, they just, they don't seem to even be able to be qualified for the positions they're holding. It's not even that they're evil, it's just that they're they're lazy or something. Um, that I mean, it, it makes you feel insecure just as a regular citizen who is awake. Now, I'm going to give you the floor, because you mentioned me on the phone when we talked before the show <clears throat> uh, about, about the 9-11 research model you came up with. Can you go over that with the audience? Oh, sure. Uh, as a result of, you know, studying so many uh, different researchers and, and, and trying to uh, relay the information in my uh, activism efforts, what occurred to me, Andy, is that uh, they kind of fit into these five different categories. And um, let me just... Here we go. I call it the, the research model, deconstructing the evidence. And there are five of them. Geopolitics, procedural anomalies, physical evidence, the false flags in historical context, and then the cover-up. <laughs> Those five. And um, there you go. So I think they're all pretty important here to really get a... a, a comprehensive understanding here because okay say you know you you look at the physical evidence and that's that's very important for the following reason uh what needs to happen is um the prosecution of this crime okay and to uh to uh, conduct any prosecution uh physical evidence is very, very important. We have expert witnesses talking about um, their, from their expertise, the, how physical evidence applies that is undeniable, that is scientific. And so any jury would look at this information and see what's undeniable. Then, of course, you have the um, uh, hard uh, circumstantial evidence and all these other things that come into play. You have guilty behavior, guilty demeanor, uh, and so forth. So that's why the physical evidence is so important. Um, then to get a, a broader understanding is um, the fact that 
you know, the geopolitics of this, the decades-long agenda uh, for dominance in uh, the uh, Central Asia area around the Caspian Sea with, you know, uh, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of resources, right? That, uh, there's a big new Brzezinski called that the prize, the great prize in his book uh, called The Grand Chessboard. So we have this uh, global um, uh, adversarial positioning here by superpowers that are after those resources, okay? And, um, and of course, we have the U.S. model here uh, where it's always been about empire, uh, where we would go all over the world in making sure that uh, every government as possible would be uh, – the type that would be um, agreeable to our U.S. corporate interests. And uh, so that means the setting up of client states, toppling any governments um, that did not go along with the program, which has been done uh, several times. And so this is the geopolitics of 9-11 as well, because uh, – as we uh, now know, well, I, I hope people are aware of, if, if not, they need to be aware of the fact that General Wesley Clark reported after visiting the White House days after 9-11 uh, that he spoke to a senior general there and was told that uh, it wasn't only just Afghanistan that they were going to go after, which is what Wesley Clark expected Okay, because we were told this, this was an attack masterminded by bin Laden, right? Within, like I said earlier, within one hour of those attacks, his face was on TV. So Wesley Clark's expectation when he visited the Pentagon uh, was uh, we're going into Afghanistan, right? And he was told it's much worse than that. Seven countries are on the list in, in the Middle East. Okay, there were Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Iran. Uh, Libya, which that's history now, right? Uh, Somalia, I think Sudan, and um, let's see, what's the seventh one? Well, Syria. That's right, Syria. There you go. There's the seven. Um, another important thing about the geopolitics is in Afghanistan, uh, there was an attempt to take control of a pipeline that was needed uh, to extract oil from um, the Caspian region then out to the Indian Ocean. And this pipeline had, had to go through Afghanistan. And so once people start to, uh, you know, realize this information about this pipeline situation, they start to say, okay, wow. And then 9-11 occurred, of course, as a pretext to go into Afghanistan and take control and um, have our corporate interests uh, build the pipeline. So these are the kinds of things that uh, occur in, in these uh, empire-building events. Um, Right. No, you're right. And and you know, just to reiterate to our our audience, we usually focus just on the science there. But given that the science is accurate, that this is what we know happened in the buildings, what Les is talking about is what a real investigation would look like, and these are the questions that would have to be asked. These are the facts that would have to be looked at in pursuing a real investigation. Now, you also talked to me, and I want to make sure you get a chance to to get this into the show about the five personality types and how that relates to the, the movement to expose what really happened on 9-11. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, just like there's a you know, the type A personality, everybody's heard of that, and type B personality. Um, when it comes to uh, truth awareness, political truth awareness, um, I feel that there are five different, or I'm sorry, four different types of uh, personalities. A type A truth personality requires full-blown truth, regardless of how challenging the information may be uh, and how upsetting. They say, you know what, give me the whole truth. I don't care how confronting it may be. I need to know so I can understand my world here. Then type B is only interested in partial truth, up to a point, in other words. 
Uh, they may believe that war is wrong, that there's been lies about the, you know, going into Iraq and uh, so forth, and they feel, well, yeah, we need government reforms, and, you know, the Democrats are better than the Republicans, that kind of stuff. We need better health care, education, policies, improvements, those kind of things. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, taking on the facts that, that indicate that, uh, uh, you know, a, a heinous attack like 9-11 was actually or orchestrated by elements in our government. No, that's just a step too far. So that's partial truth. Then you have type C. <laughs> this is the type of person we've all seen where uh, uh, they believe their government is absolutely righteous and noble, exceptional compared to all other countries around the world. And, uh, these are the type of people that uh, you know would wouldn't even begin to be able to handle the, this type of controversial information, and they think that you're anti-American. You know, we've heard that uh, when actually we we're more American than anybody because we're trying to uh, uh, to stop the criminality in the highest levels. We're trying to unravel the treason and, and get justice and accountability. We're the we're the ones that are pro-American here, so. Uh, but but this type of person, type C, you know, it's very interesting. There are types of people that are just you would just be totally shattered. I mean, it's the destruction of their innocence, and um, can't handle the, the, the circuits just overload, and they want to fight you. <laughs> All right, so uh, that they'd, they'd rather actually. Um, Fight you and you know be in conflict with you, than being open to considering that you know since yes there's so much evidence of government lies that maybe you could be true uh, this could be true be, they'd rather hold on to their innocence and, and their uh, view of U.S. exceptionalism. Then type D is interesting. These are people who do know the truth, but they refuse to take any action to expose it. And, and, and to uh, restore uh, what needs to be restored in this country in terms of getting back to, uh, uh, you know, constitutional freedoms, et cetera. And these, there are many reasons why, Andy, I feel there, there are some that, you know, they feel it's, they're not going to expose the truth if it means losing their job or pension. This is all self-interest stuff here. Uh, so, also, you have... Some people have fear that the country would be torn apart, the stock market would crash, uh, the, you know, every, there would be a total meltdown here of uh, institutions and society. So that's interesting because, you know, when Watergate hit, you know, there was also this feeling that, um, you know, everything was just breaking apart here in the country. But... You know, things didn't break apart, obviously. Uh, once the, the rule of law was put to bear, uh, things came back together after Watergate, and, uh, you know, justice and accountability really meant a lot here. So, but, but I do find that there are people that feel if, if the truth of 9-11 were to happen, were, were to be exposed, uh, there would be a meltdown, and they fear that worse which is totally wrong. And on the contrary, exposing the truth of 9-11 and getting justice and accountability is our greatest hope. It is our greatest um, platform for creating the future for this country um, that is sustainable, that is, uh, that is, I have to use the word righteous, and, and um, uh, you know, based on the, the principles of freedom, constitutional rights, and uh, functional democracy. This is our greatest hope. That's what uh, this type C and D has to realize. And, well, B as well. Right, and and I, I agree, and I've, I've said that sentiment many times. I think actually exposing this would be the best thing that ever happened to America, and it would actually show our strength. And you know, in regard to type D personalities, yeah, there's a lot of people like that, and you list reasons, possible motivations for someone to choose to be a type D personality. And I just want to add to that my own perception that it just seems that being a type D personality is what is in vogue lately. That it's just, it's it's cool to not care, according to the uh 
culture creators on the TV. It's cool to be stupid. You notice that the new portrayed alpha male in the media is just somebody that's just completely aloof, doesn't care, just is interested in, in their stuff and chasing women, and that's about it, man. It's just not cool because when you when you actually care about stuff and you have to acknowledge the truth, that's going to make you a little angry. That's going to challenge that whole kind of cool exterior that you put on. And that's just not, you know, that's not going to make you very popular, right. at least right now. Right. But what's funny, and I want, to, I want to get this, and I want to announce to the audience, too, that I'm going to have a video, my own video. I'm kind of slow in getting it up, but my own video of uh, the events in New York City. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But there's an engineer that we interview, and he said... Uh, this is well. This person signed our petition finally, and he said that he was concerned that by signing the petition at first, that it might hamper his ability to get jobs and things like that. But then he ended up signing the position, the petition, because now he feels that having signed the petition will be a plus. That it's getting to the point now and getting to the future. That in the future, it's going to be a plus in on his resume mm. that he joined Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth. Mm. So a lot of what we do is about changing that perception that not caring is cool. Changing that perception that that going along with the uh, the the, the uh, fake conservatives and the Obaminoids and, and just believing in this left-right paradigm and sticking within the controlled narrative of the TV that the TV gives you right. is, is cool. We're changing that because people are beginning to realize that you know following that path has not really led us into a good position. We're the ones offering reality and truth and, and setting people's minds free. Well, Andy, what really um, I think highlights what you're speaking to right now is if you go to those newspaper articles about the Canada controversy and you scroll down and look at the reader comments, they're amazing. Have you done that? Yeah, I say that's another point to make. Yeah, you look at all of these articles that are attacking us and usually they get an army of folks and this are all, these aren't all the same person this is not one you know conspiracy theorist uh, uh, you know with multiple accounts or anything I mean, you can see that these the Facebook profiles are all these different people with their own lives coming in and defending the truth defending physics I mean go figure going defending scientific reality right you know but when I saw more. those comments Andy I was just uh, so am amazed and pleased uh, uh, and, and I just got this feeling that, you know what, the hard work of the researchers and the activists around the country has gotten through despite the attempts by the media to uh, keep a lid on the truth and to also, despite the attempts of the, um, the image makers and the thought controllers to keep a lid on this. Because that's exactly what has been happening uh, where there has been very... A clear and um, deliberate attempts here to uh, dismiss and discredit questioning 9/11. Uh, trying to, you know, the uh, officials there in Canada saying that it was, the signs were disrespectful, that kind of thing. Also, uh, any questioning 9/11 somehow insensitive to the families. They always want to say you're hurting the families, which is ridiculous. Uh, but but what it is, it's psychological operations here and despite all the psyops here in the media and the government coming from the government to try and uh, control the thinking and the awareness level of the people when you read those co reader comments uh, again the the work of the uh, the activists and the researchers and our own media people like yourself and our uh, the, all who post to, to YouTube etc it's seeped through regardless of, of the uh, efforts to keep a lid on this information. Right, and it's because, we, again, it's not because we are so clever, that we are so persuasive, that we figured out some way to dance around them and be better at, at manipulating people than they have. It's because we're telling the truth, okay? If I look up in the sky and I say, that sky is blue, it's a bright sunny morning, that sky is blue, I'm not being persuasive or or uh, being a great at selling you an idea. I'm basically stating a basic truth. All right, two plus two equals four. That's not that, that's not being being persuasive. That's just mathematical reality. Yeah. The mat the physical reality is 105 feet of free fall in Building Seven means explosives brought it down. 
Okay, and we keep on reinforcing that that message out there because that is, I mean, because that's what people need to realize. They need to have it sink in for them. Yeah. And beca- being truthful, acknowledging reality is becoming the new cool. And it also people are realizing that they have to do it for their own survival. Okay, yeah. the old tricks, the whole oh, that's so disrespectful to the families. All of these these buzzwords, these taglines are not working all right it's like they're they're swinging their arms really slow in this boxing match and they're failing at making or connecting their punches anymore it's just it's lame their trick is over the facade is falling and soon they're going to have to acknowledge it they can't they can't stop it anymore yeah, yeah. i think due to uh this weariness and this fatigue of uh you know all these wars according to Janie uh Dick Cheney's quote, wars that won't last, uh, I'm sorry, wars that won't end in our lifetime. <laughs> People are really fatigued. Then add on all the revelations here from uh, uh, Edward Snowden about uh, the NSA, you know, intrusions and, uh, you know, absolute violations of uh, privacy and constitutional freedoms. And people, people are aware of the that the uh, the Patriot Act and the NDAA are so far um, so far afield from anything that would remotely resemble a country based on a Bill of Rights. You know, people I think get that, and even though uh, most people are apolitical in terms of uh, their activism, you know, most people uh, are just now uh, I think finally getting to the point where. Uh, they're realizing, yeah, come on, I don't trust this government. And, and uh, that, Congress, come on. Um, they have a higher uh, trust rating. I'm sorry, um, they have a lower trust rating than a used car salesman. So uh, this is where I think the state of consciousness in this country has gone to, and uh, even more so around the world, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, people uh, – you know, around the world in terms of their regard of what the U.S. government is up to. So, I don't know. Uh, it's getting very interesting here. And uh, what are we? Here's the question: Where we go? Where do we go from here in terms of getting full accountability? Uh, maybe we can. Hopefully, uh, this will build this rethink 9/11 campaign, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, will build to the point where it is impossible, it's unstoppable, and where politicians or media people will have to take note. And uh, we are seeing some signs of that uh, I'm sorry, CBS Philadelphia article, I agree, was the most even-handed, um, you know, neutral article I've seen in years. And then also in the New York Times, for God's sakes, uh, there was an article on 9-11 where in the very last paragraph, there was a mention uh, that there's also questions about 9-11 being asked this year by a group of architects and engineers, and it had a link to the Rethink.org, Rethink9-11.org website. You know what? That, that little thing, to me, was a breakthrough. From, uh, and so we're, we're seeing little things happening here that in some, some not so little things, we're seeing signs that there is a broad, uh, broad based awareness of uh, the facts of 9-11. We're seeing signs that there is a greater distrust of government. And um, so what we have to do is keep at it and then kind of um, see where our um, civics responsibilities take us next uh, in terms of uh, pressuring. For instance, in New York, there were, on, on 9-11, this, uh, one of the stops, Andy, as you may remember, was at City Council, and there were, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, VIP packets from architects and engineers from 9-11 Truth delivered to each one of those uh, City Council members. I believe it was 51 or 52. Okay, so so... Now, shouldn't they also get involved here in the, uh, the research and the explanation for why Building 7 fell and why the, the NIST report is a total cover-up? You know? Well, right. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I think a big part of, of 
getting people even more behind this. First of all, the the stuff with the media being even handed, I think they realize that to stay relevant, they're going to have to start facing this because people are turning them off left and right. Um, but part of getting people even more so behind this is presenting a better future than what the blue, the flickery blue box and the politicians are offering. And, and, and showing people the fact that, you know, exposing this, doesn't mean the world is going to end. Everything is going to be okay. Uh, you know, it doesn't reflect on America, on Americans, just on a small group of, of bad people. Okay. Now, I wanted in our last few minutes, you know, because we only got a few more minutes left, um, it, to, to just get your thoughts on the Rethink Rally in New York, what your impressions on how it went and your experiences. Sure. Well, the rally was absolutely a, a highlight and a milestone of the entire 9-11 Truth Movement in all its history. The accomplishment of getting that billboard up there, and uh, as you say, it's, it, in real life it's quite impressive um, in the fact uh, that it's in the, the, the capital of commercialism or the, the epicenter of commercialism on the planet, which is Times Square. And then here you see this political billboard, Rethink911.org, uh, did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? The evidence may surprise you. So that is profound. And then the there was, I'd say, three to 400 people there uh, specifically for the event. And, of course, passers-by there were, you know, we have this huge sound system and a stage, and uh, uh, it could be heard for, uh, you know, a block or two away. So a lot of people saw that. And it was profound. It was uh, exciting. It was electric. Uh, and also, you know, I have to add that this, you know, it was a, uh, or began as a remembrance and a commemoration uh, as you started out the show, Andy, of uh, the people who died that day and the a million plus who've died since. Okay. Um, that is so important. And of course, um, also a remembrance of the first responders, their heroism, and then their um, the, the tragedy that they had to experience uh, as a result of being lied to by official sources about the uh, air quality. So um, that was important to, to always keep in, in mind. And then, of course, we uh, paid homage to Colonel Robert Bowman, who passed away in August, uh, such an important figure in the movement who was always calling for uh, investigation. He was a fighter pilot. So we were speaking earlier about the uh, uh, procedural anomalies and the stand down of NORAD, and he was a fighter. He was a NORAD pilot. Okay, so it's important to uh, include him. And then the speakers were were absolutely riveting. Uh, we had <clears throat> uh, Richard Gage open it up, and uh, he was powerful. And uh, here's here's the man who is spearheaded. Uh, this phenomenal organization that is now 2,026 architects and engineers calling for a new investigation. Right, and I, what I love about the billboard and the location of the rally is, uh, you know, particularly with the billboard, is that it's right at a light, so people, you know, stopping at a red light will have time to look up at it and reflect. Les, we are actually out of time. Sure. I want to have you back on. It's been great talking to you. This uh, whole hour just flown by really fast. Folks, remember you can listen to this program every Thursday night at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific on No Lies Radio. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck.